ხელმოგებიან Ukrainian megapreps, the colleagues, the Kumov through said this aggressions, aggressions from Melis Arari suits Kosaka to Lustris. To get some hard at Era, Dak or Bastard, but dress Ukrainian's Mamats Air Saka to Luskan, we need the Roman Lom Ukrainian Sharis, followed Ertikot and some emerges in Amdek, Aramides, Europol Democratis, Omi Authoritarism in Amdek, Ukrainian Levis, Cartolevis, the Europe Levis, Tavis of Lebusatus. The Czech of the Trans Project, Shekhar Senate from Oval or Shabbat, or the Teberu than Otri Aprilis Chatwit, Tramitatse, Gai Marteba Sebi, Romans Diet Moba, Umagli Sagan Matlab of Sperushi, Tanamedrove Gamma's Orbis Ganshilas. This conception of the Lobas Mirabel, Professional Musicosabita, Umagli Sagan Matlab of the Sebolabis Armad Gelebi, Sophios at Semit Quebec. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Ivar Gagnadze, the head of the uh, Department of International Depa uh, Relations at Pil State Conservatory. And in collaboration with Malmo Academy of Music, I'd like to present international panel discussion series, Freedom in Music Education. Before we begin the official part of our meeting, I'd like to state that we are horrified by Russia's barbaric attacks in Ukraine. The State Conservatory strongly supports our Ukrainian friends and colleagues. We'd like to express our solidarity to Ukrainian partner institutions and Ukrainian people. We have the partner institutions in Kharkiv, National Kotlarevsky University of Arts, Ukrainian National Tchaikovsky Academy of Music in Kyiv, Nizhdanova National Academy of Music in Odessa, Lysenko National Music Academy in Lviv. We, of course, understand that Ukraine now needs everybody's support, strong support from the free Western allies, as the battle is now for general peace and freedom in the democratic world. To come back to our discussion, I'd like to remind you that the six meetings will be held within the project and current challenges of the higher music education will be discussed. International experts, professional musicians and the representatives of high educational institutions will be the speakers of the events from more than 10 countries of the world. Discussions will be live streamed uh, and presented on the State Conservatory Facebook page every Monday at 4 CET from 24th, uh, 28th of February to the 4th of April. The main topic of the first meeting is freedom in the classrooms, is the golden ratio. Uh, and our speakers for this meeting are uh, Nina Zwania, she's a Georgian pianist and musicologist, Dina Lenster, professor of music theory and composition at Capitol University Conservatory in Columbus, Ohio, US, and Danilo Machete, a pianist from Italy. I'm very proud to have you all here. And uh, for the first meeting, we asked our participants to discuss freedom in the classrooms and so-called Western versus Eastern way of upbringing. Also, how do we present music making and music performance to the students at high music educational institutions? If the teacher is always a giver and the student is always the receiver. Also at the reaction, the reactions on initiatives interpretation and non-traditional methods of teaching. So our first speaker is Nino Zwania, and Nino Zwania studied the piano and musicology at uh, Tbilisi Conservatory and Robert Schumann Hochschule in uh, Dusseldorf, Germany. She is the prize winner of various international piano competitions and the author of several scholarly works and a monograph. In 2020-22, she led the very first fundamental research project dedicated to the artistic research in Georgia that was financed by Shota Rustavelli National Science Foundation. Dernino, the floor is yours and we'd like to um, hear from you. Um, dear Ivari, thank, thank you thank first you. of all for uh, inviting me to participate in this very, very interesting series dedicated to the most topical and important issues of uh, higher music education. But if we, before I start talking about freedom, freedom in the classroom, I have to say, I really have to say that there is nothing uh, much I can do for people who fight now for their freedom, I mean the people of Ukraine, but I really uh, want to dedicate this speech um, to those courageous and brave uh, 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 women and men and kids 
who are right now suffering from and struggling against Russia. And I just want to say that uh, Slava Ukraini, Hero and Slava. Now I'll go back uh, to this topic, freedom and the clusters. Um, I will talk about this subject actually based on uh, uh, reflection upon my own personal uh, experience as a teacher and supervisor um, at uh, Tbilisi State Concert. I have been teacher for, oh my God, I can't believe, but almost 17 years. So I think I have the right to um, discuss this subject based on my experience. All meanings we know depend on the key of interpretation, writes George Eliot in Daniel Deronda. This sentence I got acquainted with about 10 years ago has not only changed my worldview, but also my attitude to the art of music performance, research and teaching. Finding keys of interpretation has become the main task of my professional life, as well as life generally. Consequently, I do believe that the most important duty of a teacher is to teach students how to find those keys, first and foremost, the right keys. Though what is the right and what is wrong? Having supervised students in various courses, be it piano, new music ensemble, writing master thesis and doctoral dissertations, contemporary piano performance for 17 years, I'm still unsure whether we can talk about right and wrong interpretation of music. We live in the epoch of historically informed performance when interpretations of some great names of the past have been of question. At the same time, Willem de Kooning said once, answering the question, which painter of the past influenced him the most? The past does not influence me, I influence it. And that is true. Stockhausen does influence Beethoven, having performed and heard Brahms, Schoenberg, Cage, Reich, Stockhausen, with both intentionally and unintentionally bring those experiences into our interpretation of the great German composer. So what can I teach? How to sort problems out and how to solve them, how to practice, how to analyze, how to research, how to obtain the foundational knowledge, how to become independent step by step and eventually how to find own key of interpretation, persuasive for oneself and more or less acceptable for others. Any student has to learn them. Any teacher has to supervise him, her on this interesting and challenging way. I had a wonderful teacher in piano at the said Conservatoire. Professor Putia raised all of her students as independent musicians, encouraging them to think critically. She supervised us in individual ways, always taking into consideration our personal traits, abilities, skills, and interests. She always motivated us to offer our ideas and views on interpretation, and thus to become free-thinking professional musicians. At the same time, she was quite strict, demanding high-quality performance of any task, and we always knew there is no alternative to highly disciplined practice. That's why we all differed from each other in performance style. Many classes of some famous professors in Georgia and post-Soviet countries lacked and still lack this feature. Today, one would define her approach as a student-centered one, while the Soviet education and music education in particular was rather teacher-oriented, with all respect to some great teachers that Russian and Soviet you know, school are based on. Thus, my approach to teaching is grounded on Professor Hubutia's ideas. All general rules, methods must be adjusted to an individual student, and the student should be encouraged to develop critical thinking skills. He, she should be able to question even the most sacred dogmas of the music world. I learned how to avoid dogmatism not only from my teacher. I have specific interest for contemporary art music. And this interest influenced my approach to performing and teaching as well. As a rule, I have to play pieces that are free of any performance traditions. And I have to literally discover them for myself and for listeners, relying mostly only on scores. It is performance traditions that quite often impose specific burdens on us performers when we have 
to interpret music of the past. Traditions sometimes tend to transform themselves into cliches that determine the art of performance in educational systems, art, music competitions, concerts, etc. These cliches are part of professional life of any musician. And as a teacher, I have to prepare my students for that life, especially taking into consideration the fact that some traditions are very valuable and important. However, I think step-by-step step, students have to learn how to great, create their own interpretation, how to discover pieces by themselves. And my duty is to teach them how to do that in a highly professional way. How to teach a student critical thinking skills? I believe, first of all, they have to learn to evaluate themselves. At first lessons with my students in piano class, they mostly get confused when I ask them to analyze their performance, to assess their strengths and weaknesses. Coming from music schools and being highly dependent on opinion of their teachers, they find it extremely complicated to switch to another mode of learning. However, step by step, they learn how to evaluate themselves, define the problems and eventually solve them. At the same time, they learn how to formulate the tasks they have to undertake to solve those problems. It is this ability that helps them to later express and justify their opinions when they work as teachers, ensemble members, a company obliged to discuss problems of interpretation with students and colleagues. I also encourage my students to argue with me over my recommendations and advices if they do not agree with them. However, their argument should be consistent and justified. I do believe that in order to survive a contemporary music world full of famous stars, prize winners and stereotypes, a musician has to have something that makes him unique and valuable. If we cultivate in our students freedom of thought, supply them with profound knowledge in the related field, teach them how to use this knowledge and how to develop further, we will give them the opportunity to find their own place in a diverse world of music. In 2010, I participated in junior fellowship development program that enabled me to stay for one semester at New England Conservatory, Boston, and to observe their classes. It was while observing classes when I realized how democracy and freedom of thought works in educational system. That was one of the most striking experiences of my professional life. I was born in an authoritarian country, the Soviet Union with authoritarian educational system. It was not only teacher-centered, but also oriented on children and students of distinguished abilities. This uh, was and still is especially typical for musical education that aims to discover and raise stars, employing strict discipline. There are many cliches about being su successful in music in all post-Soviet states. Due to those cliches, students that do not have specific abilities, such as excellent memory, nervous system stability, artistic personality, exceptional technical skills are not considered appropriate for musical education and career. The most important idea of creating learning approach I got acquainted with in the US is that students working in small teams, each with participants of different levels of ability, use various learning activities and achieve more than students put in individualistic or competitive learning system. Having generalized this idea, I realized that music education system of post-Soviet countries just does not encourage students of various abilities who could contribute to development of music in different ways. Thus discovering particular abilities and talents of students and developing them because uh, became the main purpose of my teaching especially teaching piano. Working with students for several years gives me time to identify their strengths, develop them and help students to reach their potential by directing their interests in particular directions, be it concert performance, collaborative piano, artistic research or pedagogy. We all are affected by our professions. Teachers make quite an interesting case in this respect. Having taught for years, we usually forget that we have to learn from time to time in order to be able to teach further. That's why I always try to back to the position of a student 
Various scholarship I got and programs I participated in as a teacher allow me to observe classes in the US, in Germany and other countries. With those programs, within those programs, not only have I learned from my American and German colleagues how to design and hold courses, how to assess students, but also have experienced student life, doing students' homework on my own initiative. I wanted to make myself fully acquainted with subjects I am particularly interested in and to look at educational system from students' point of view. I'm especially thankful to orientation courses and summer schools preparing me for my stays in the US as they introduced to me the most recent and important achievements of the field of general pedagogy. Applying some principles uh, of general pedagogy to musical one have definitely contributed to my professional development as a teacher. I do believe that primary task of supervisor, teacher, is to help a student to finish particularly, let's say, project in time and to support him, her, to become an independent and critically thinking musician or researcher. The most important challenge is to keep balance between independence and guidance. As a supervisor and teacher, I do provide my students with feedback about their development. And this feedback is not and should not always be positive, but I have never had any problems with negative feedback. As students always know and feel that it's crucially important for their progress. And I consciously act in their best interest. In this regard, it's very helpful that my relationship to my students is intentionally personalized. As an active piano teacher, even in thesis writing, I prefer live sessions over online consultations, so pandemic forces us to employ online lessons active. Meeting in person and live discussions, in my opinion, always help much better to evaluate the real situation, especially when it comes to specific problems to overcome, such as, for example, writer's block, difficulty finishing a repertoire or thesis, issues of time management, stress. Quite often, particular problems are caused by difficulties in other fields of life. I believe that my role is not only to share with students my knowledge and professional experience, but also to give advice on how to overcome the difficulties mentioned about relying on my own life experience. One of the biggest shocks of my life was to see the fencing construct of New York University Holmes Bob's library. This construct was erected against 12 stocks of books and journals to prevent stress and tire students from jumping down and committing suicide. The library has been the site of several deaths since 2003. At the same time, I'm aware of the fact that personalized relationship between a supervisor and student should never be too intimate. We have to teach them, teach them to solve all kinds of problems independently. So what about freedom in the classroom? My students often tell me that the most important element of my teaching system that supports them during their studies is freedom that I offer them. They always feel free to express their ideas that motivates them to search for them. I'm happy to say that they have never misused my openness, but I am aware of a possibility of such cases and I'm ready to handle them. The golden rule I learned at one of the forums organizing for supervisors is supervision must be personalized, but not intimate. I always follow this rule and it helps me to avoid complicated situations. As for my rather democratic attitude, it's like any personal trait. It can turn into disadvantage and I'm aware of this too. That's why I'm very careful while motivating my students to find their own keys of interpretation. I always insist that the process of searching is based on foundational knowledge of a subject. And I know that I always have to develop the skills to provide them with this knowledge. Maybe that's the golden ratio we're searching for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really, yes. It was very interesting and very inspiring. I hope it brings the, some inspiration to our virtual audience, which we'll have. And basically, actually, uh, what I wanted to uh, fo have follow-ups, you already had it in your speech, and it was very 
very nice. And actually, I re uh, it reminded me of uh, Isabella Wagner, Isabella Wagner's book, uh, Producing Excellence, The Making of Virtuoso. And she has very strict opinions about it. And basically what she says is that, yeah, our uh, sometimes we, we make our teachers as a God person, that they are always right. They have to be always uh, right and we have to follow every uh, instruction and everything they say. And she has three levels of uh, teacher pupil and parent relationship uh, and for earlier stages the parent is very much involved and then the only teacher and student uh, stay but at the higher education that we talk now in music education the freedom because of then it's uh, really is about the independent human being an independent musician that needs to have the freedom of interpretation that we need to find yes thank you very much Bernino, and now Yes, and now we can move on with the uh, next speaker, Tina Lenster. She's a PhD and professor of music theory and comp uh, composition at Capital University in Columbus, Ohio, the US. She uh, completed her undergraduate and graduate studies in Russia and received her PhD in music theory from the Ohio State University. At Capital uh, University, Dr. Lenster has taught music theory, ear training, form and analysis, Counterpoint, music history, composition, Russian opera, and a few interdisciplinary courses. Her research published in the US, Canada, France, uh, Switzerland, Hungary, Ukraine, Georgia, and Lithuania focuses on uh, multidisciplinary analysis and interpretation of music with poetic, literary, and documentary texts. Thank you uh, and uh, for being here from the US. It's morning in the US and the floor is yours now. Ivrit, thank you so much for including me uh, into this um, important discussion. It, it is my honor to be here. Uh, before I start addressing the topic of today's gathering, uh, I would like to express my deepest support uh, for the people of Ukraine, and uh, particularly my dear friends and colleagues at the Tchaikovsky Ukrainian National Academy of Music, many of whom have stayed in Kiev and who are facing a very painful reality and very troubling future. So I'm thinking of you, my friends. In my comments, I am going to echo a lot of Nino's points, um, uh, but I would like to focus on the topics of student-teacher student relationship in the contemporary music theory or music history classroom or all the related disciplines. And some innovating strategies and approaches that have become more and more prevalent in, in the American higher education, specifically music higher education. As Ivory mentioned, I received my PhD from the Ohio State University here in Columbus, Ohio, where I live. But all my previous undergraduate and graduate studies took place in Russia. Therefore, I myself am a product of the very traditional teacher-centered educational background, um, where I was uh, taught to how to do things, how to play piano, how to think, how to think about music, but most importantly, what to think about music. Not so much how to learn the material myself how important it is to ask questions, how to question everything, and how often there is no one absolute answer when we're talking about music. Most of the times there is not, no one absolute answer. But at the same time, I don't want to downplay the strength of the Eastern European music uh, education system, particularly of the uh, 1980s and 1990s where I was a student, where I learned, of, uh, I learned the foundations of everything I know. And most importantly, the value of being a creative person. I was a composition major in the St. Petersburg Conservatory. And my creativity was encouraged and supported by everybody uh, who taught it there. And that's what leads me to the issue of freedom in the classroom of the third decade of the 20th century a completely new educational environment in which we are finding ourselves right now. 
I am working with young people who are very different from me. Some of the students I teach, um, and they all are seeking bachelor of music degree in either music performance, music education, composition, music technology or music industry. So some of them may have no idea about the Western musical canon or a fully diminished seven chord. But at the same time, they are privileged to enjoy an instant access to any type of music and any kind of information about music 24 hours a day. These students I'm talking about can use libraries for their research project remotely while wearing pajamas in their dormitories. They can study scores of great composers online for free. They can study abroad almost anywhere. Further, furthermore, uh, their musical career goals may not include playing flute in New York Philharmonic, but maybe composing music for video games or performing as a singer songwriter in some music club, I don't know, in Nashville, Tennessee. So for the longest time, I believe that having high standards in my teaching and inspiring students to achieve them would make them better musicians, no matter what they do, which ultimately would lead them to successful careers in music. That's what I thought. But now with easily, easily noticeable cultural shift, I'm finding myself on the new ground, grappling with these questions and more and more so every year. Questions are, how can I better relate to my students? How do I teach the students something that they can actually use in their projected careers? What is my function as a teacher? If the student, my students can simply Google the content of the classes and they can find the perfectly satisfactory free lesson on YouTube on the diminished seven chords or in Sonata Allegro form. What is it that only I can give my students? and the virtual world that is their fingertips cannot. And what I found through going to teaching workshops and conferences, uh, reflecting a lot and learning from my uh, successful peers, what I learned is that passive learning works only for some students who are already independent, self-directed learners. And then there is a big difference between the information and the knowledge. I can teach my students how to find information, but I cannot construct their knowledge. Only they can. So I changed my mind. I decided that perhaps in this new to me cultural context, my job is to create an inviting, non judgmental learning environment in which all my students, no matter how strong or weak they may be, would be comfortable discovering themselves as musicians and as learners. Through this approach coined by uh, educational theorist, uh, student-centered teaching and learning, I'm trying to provide my students with tools, both uh, specific to a particular class uh, with its own learning outcomes and some more general tools contributing to mastering uh, critical thinking and critical listening skills. Based on my uh, teaching experience, I'm confident that unless my students believe they can benefit from the knowledge I'm helping them to construct, my teaching efforts are futile. Implementing this uh, teaching philosophy is not easy. And I have been trying to master it, with some successes and many, many failures for the past 15 years. And I'm trying to do it in my different courses, music history, music theory and harmony, form and analysis, counterpoint. And I have seen it done by some of my music colleagues here at Capital University um, in their classes and even ensembles such as in choir. This approach entails something that is very difficult to swallow. I would have to give up to some extent the power and the ultimate authority of myself as a teacher. 
when I accept a role of a facilitator and mentor instead of my student's musical prophet, I need to embrace all the differences in students' music sensibility, students' ability or honestly inability to articulate their ideas and their previous knowledge and their differing work ethics because not everybody has that. In order to keep this creative and fruitful dialogue uh, with the students, I needed to use specific strategies that both place students in the center of my teaching universe, but at the same time, keep them accountable for their process of learning. So here I'm just uh, I'm gonna offer a few highlights. First, uh, I utilize what is known as flipped classroom approach, where students come to class after they already explore a new material themselves using a textbook, Google, whatever they want. And they, need, they would complete a homework or a project, which is, by the way, not unlike piano professors uh, expect students to come to their first lesson with the music memorized. Don't you think so? I remember it was shocking to me and it happened when I was composition major in the St. Petersburg Conservatory. I was mortified by that uh, expectation. So I am there to help students to master and apply the new material, but not to introduce it initially. I let them deal with it themselves at their own time. In other words, I should not be delivering information students have at their textbook and at their fingertips. Second, it is very important to solicit students' reflections and their self-assessment of their learning experiences. And I use those as a feedback for me, informing me whether my teaching strategies work at all, or I would have to adjust them if they don't. This can be done by utilizing learning journals or learning portfolios or one minute papers that students can complete the class in 60 seconds, but it's priceless information for me as a pedagogue. Next, I think it's very important to utilize a peer reliance system where students work in teams and you know already mentioned it to either obtain information, discuss information, practice, formulate their questions and then interact with other teams and with me as a facilitator. Uh, fourth point, it is also very important to create a routine in our classes that engages both the course content and creative thinking. And most importantly, it should feel like discovery for students. For example, students come to my form and analysis class with the entry ticket, like entry ticket, where they would need to determine and argue for a form of a assigned composition, be it like binary, ternary, free form, but they have to argue why they decided it's such. And it should be like informed argument, not just because I feel so. And they would leave classroom with the exit ticket where they would need to answer one tiny question or, or um, articulate a thought that has something to do with uh, something small to do with what we just discussed in class. So this is kind of routine that worked for me in that class. So these are just few examples of st uh, student-centered teaching that focuses on the active engagement of students in their learning. Not all of my students will end up um, professional musicians, not at all. But I hope after taking my classes, they would have more confidence in being able to learn new things and uh, ultimately work toward their perhaps changing life goals. I truly believe that in the contemporary environment in higher music education institution, a student teacher relationship must be fluid and flexible where each party is constantly learning from one another and thus developing, growing and transforming together. Uh, there should be freedom to teach what has been needed to be learned 
and that particular moment in time. And it requires dedication, trust, and a lot of creativity, which is arguably a true meaning of uh, academic freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. And actually, like I always say that we are really surrounded with this Europe-centric Europe -centered environment and which is more conservative, even if you go to more progressive countries, it is still more conservative than the uh, US. And uh, it is always interesting to hear the other experiences, other methods. And I see that like, for example, when we're talking about this uh, student-centered uh, education, like we go farther and we don't only want to have the student centered, but also they to take to make initiatives and to to be student centered and also student be there when they make their own study plans, when they make our uh, plans about the, their uh, future developments. And uh, uh, also like when it comes to the uh, when you mentioned that, that yeah, and like uh, uh, not everyone becomes the professional musicians in the end. Yeah, because it is all about the well-being of the students and also the including everyone. So the question of the inclusion and diversity, which might sound that this progressive and it is something new. No, it's there and we just need to discover it. So thank you very much. And uh, our next uh, speaker is um, Danilo Maschetti. He is a pianist from Italy and he's a member of the Lacomo uh, International Piano Academy, the Karn um, Trust Junior Fellow at the Royal College of Music of London, also artistic director of Arte Solidale Festival. And uh, Danilo, I, uh, the floor is yours and we'll be uh, really listening to you to share your experience because I know you've been busy all these years with different festivals, different academies, different concerts. So go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say thanks to also Nino and Dina for their speeches because I feel like I learned a lot in these uh, few minutes and I hope I can give some good insights as well. I also want to spend a few words about the situation in Ukraine, uh, as uh, I think it's my duty. And uh, since that, uh, as artists find themselves in a very difficult situation nowadays, uh, and especially we know that there is a lot of political things going on with Russian artists, I don't want to spend my personal words, but to read a very short poem by Salvatore Quasimodo, uh, one of the main uh, Italian poems, uh, poet, uh, who wrote this poem during the Second World War, and I think that his words still apply to every situation of war, and especially to this one. Uh, the uh, poem is called Upon the Willows. Uh, I'm not a good reader, but I hope uh, his words are going to be more important than my performance of it. Um, Upon the Willows by Salvatore Quasimodo. And how could we sing with a foreign hill on our hearts, among the dead abandoned in the squares, on the hard and frozen grass, to the lament of innocent children, to the dark cry of the mother hastening to her son crucified on a telegraph pole. Upon the willows, we too, as an offering, hung our harps, which swayed quietly in the sad wind. Thank you. And uh, my support, of course, goes to Ukraine, and I hope that the situation will solve very quickly and will uh, let us go back to our normal activities, especially for that part of the world that is now hit by this tragedy. Going back to our topic, um, I can't offer an insight as a professor, as I taught only a very few pupils in my life, uh, but I'm still a senior student in an academy and I am planning to take further studies next. Uh, so what I can offer is an insight on the current situation as a young-ish performer who is going in between the concert career and the academic career at the same time. Um, so I am very glad that we all agree that initiative freedom and independent and critical thinking uh, as well as creativity are fundamental parts of uh, nowadays artists and students and it's beautiful to see that professors still care about it and don't just want to t 
stitch their way and go to bed and be happy about it and that's it. Uh, so for us, it's very important to see that there are so many professors around the world that really care about these. And I myself have been very lucky in these because I think I always found or actually chose to stay with professors who give me trust and especially uh, gave me uh, the feeling that what I was trying to do in the class and in the exam was uh, listened to in a very specific way so that my choices were considered and what I was trying to say was discussed and not just checked if it was what the teacher wanted or not. And uh, um, so I think that as a young musician nowadays, we have to answer the main question, which is what's our role? when in a time that is very different from the Soviet times, but also very different from 20 years ago, because nowadays we can listen to recordings not in the same way that we could do that in the 90s. Uh, if the uh, compact discs were a revolution, nowadays we can listen to any recording within five minutes. And so why would a young student play again a Chopin ballade? or a Tchaikovsky violin concerto. What, where is the sense of doing that when anyone can just listen to a possibly better or as good version on YouTube or wherever else? Uh, so I think that uh, today the key solution is indeed your personal creativity. Uh, and uh, I would like to focus my few minutes of speech on uh, rather than the professor which was outlined by my colleagues already on the institutions because of course you do need a good professor and that's probably just about luck or the ability of the student to uh, cope and choose the right professor and probably the professors to be able to say to the student you are the right student for me or you should rather go to this other professor but also I think that nowadays uh, institutions and in general the system of the music world uh, they also play a key role in the student education uh, so for me it's very important to try to analyze how each institution uh, is facilitating the student to become an artist or is on the other hand just trying to get them have a degree and try to get a job and uh, I can bring my own experience because I studied in Milano as well as in London and I'm now in this Le Como Piano Academy which has a very specific program and uh, I also studied with Russian uh, teachers in private academies so I more or less have a very European education of the nowadays situation and um, so I would first want to focus on the preparation of the students for what concerns exams, competitions, international competitions, and in general, the work of the student. Uh, so we can see that there are quite a few differences uh, between what is happening in Italy at the moment and what is happening in London. Um, because on one hand, uh, about my experience in Italy, um, I could see that the system was created quite well and let the student be very free but at the same time there were no programs that would really help this freedom and creativity de develop while on the other hand for instance in England I can see that exams are still very strict on some uh, specific choices of repertoire and so on but at the other hand the institution tries to make the student develop creativity with certain uh, specific programs, which I'm going to illustrate very quickly. Uh, first of all, for what regards the main difference of uh, the English and Southern Europe tradition, I would say, uh, is that the English tradition, as well, I believe the American one, are based on the ABRSM grade exams. Uh, so we have all the kids, for instance, in London, from when they're five to when they're around 18 or earlier if they're faster, they do the so-called grade exams. So they have choices, but these choices come from lists. They're not their personal choices. So everyone end up normally playing the same pieces or similar pieces that are just on a paper. And you choose it with your teacher and you go ahead, learn it during the whole year and then play your exam and goodbye. And then one arrives at college and suddenly has to prepare a recital or a concert for something. And there comes the important role of the teacher to help you in that because the system 
maybe didn't really help on that thing. While on the other hand, in Italy, there is no such a thing like exams for younger children. Before we had a sort of junior conservatoire, which now doesn't exist anymore. So it's almost all about just one-to-one -one teaching, like in most piano and instrumental teaching traditions. And then one starts the exams and uh, at that point we have again the choice of recitals and so on and uh, i have to say that uh, in my experience uh that moment is really about how the judgment happens in the institution that you are part of and that really depends not just about who is judging you but how this system is planned to help the judgment um for instance I always found very fair and useful the fact that an institution would choose to have an external professor to judge exams rather than professors from the conservatoire because that is uh, really helpful for the student to know that someone who doesn't know you personally is going to just listen to how you play and is not going to take into account how you work during the whole year because of course someone is going to be able to say well, this professor never liked me, so I'm not going to get a good grade, so why should I make an effort in this exam? Or on the other hand, uh, it could be uh, that this professor doesn't know me at all, so it's just going to listen to how I play and that's it. And in this moment is where I think creativity plays a very strong role, uh, because of course every exam in every institution has some guidelines, uh, uh, which are different but more or less we know that a student is going to learn all the repertoire uh, but problem is is that going to be uh, is creativity going to be a part that is going to be valued during the exam or not and i believe that this uh, is really connected to the level of the institution and not the level of I don't know, the facilities of the institution, but the reputation of the institution. Because normally we know that institutions that are considered to be very good are so are considered so because they have many students that do take part in international competitions or uh, students that have successful careers as well as professors that have successful careers. So in this way, uh, we can understand that the planning for exams is going to be quite different from an institution where everyone is just, I don't know, a, a regional conservatoire where no one really ever went to play concerts or these kind of things. And uh, um, so in this way, I believe that uh, the place where there are people that are able to plan ahead, uh, so for future career steps, are the places where uh, creativity can be developed in the best way. Um, so for instance, this brings us to think about the competition part. Uh, I want to uh, analyze this part because I believe that that's what a lot of students aim to do or tend to do because it's the normal path. Thinking of piano, obviously one knows that it's gonna or do competitions or going into teaching immediately or possibly going to do competition, get some experience and then going to teach. And um, so uh, if one student is doing competitions or is preparing for competitions, he's probably going to take exams in a certain way that can help to prepare for the competition as well and so on. And uh, uh, I am talking about all these parts because I'm trying to understand whether creativity can exist in this kind of things, in competitions, in exams or not. And I do believe that normally it can, but as Nino already said earlier, it's always related to high quality. And uh, in my experience, both the conservators that I attended valued creativity during exams and competitions, internal competition as well as preparation for external competitions very much. But they always uh, expected that the highest quality was uh, there before the choices that could be edgy or a bit different. And um, in this way, I do believe that I was helped very much by both institutions I was part of because uh, they were both institutions where uh, they would care about exams very much, but they also would care about the external situations very much. So 
uh, in general, I could say, or I believe I could say, that the institution becomes extremely helpful towards creativity and towards independency when it has a very good idea of what's happening outside and is not just focused on the degree program, on the fact <coughs> that students go there to get their degree and then go. The institution that best work today is towards the new artist that knows what's his role, that knows what's his own center of the pieces that decide to play or to uh, focus on are those that really understand what's around the institution, not just the institution itself. And um, uh, some institutions try to go deeper on these and not only rely on the professor's ability, which of course is the main thing of an institution, but also to create programs that uh, try to make the students develop their own creativity uh, within the context of the university, but without the professor's help. And uh, so, for instance, um, the Royal College of Music uh, has one career center, which was the first one in Europe, and then they started to uh, exist also in other institutions, in other institutions in London, as well as I know in Germany, they have many career centers and so on. And uh, it's another office that is not connected to the music departments where they do try to help students with their careers, uh, as in put them outside of the school. And at the same time, the same career center, in this case of the Royal College, created um, a sort of mini festival called Great Exhibitionist, which was not part of the piano competitions inside the school, not part of the concerto competitions, for instance, but it was just a completely different kind of competition judged by other people, not the music professors. And it was about ideas. So uh, they just created this sort of festival as a competition for proposals. And the best ones would get to be uh, performed and especially to be funded. So this helped greatly the students because they were able to just think of a project, realize it, made a business plan about it and just developed uh, develop it if it was successful and I believe that even though maybe uh, other professors would think that one should focus just on playing the piano all day uh, which is of course very useful uh, at the same time these kind of projects would help a lot the students to uh, focus on understanding what it means to create a project to create a concert a concept also that is maybe not necessarily the same thing of I'm just going to play a recital and uh, uh, transform it into reality. And uh, so I believe if on one hand we have the support of professorships uh, in the institutions, especially those that are uh, open to the external situations, also the other departments of a university play a key role today in the students' development. And this brings me to my activity as an artistic director of this festival. Uh, because um, in this way, I also have experience in what happens when you plan a concert, when you invite someone and you have to make the audience come to that concert. Uh, because if an, inside a school, uh, an institution, you have in the end to get the students get a good degree, when then they are done with their careers, as you know, it's where everything starts. It's where you see if your personality is working towards a market of music that is not easy at all or not. And uh, the problem is that nowadays audiences are still probably looking for what was the golden age of music making. If we think of big concerts by Horvitz and so on. And normal audiences still want to go to listen to that. But at the same time, we young artists want to be independent, want to be creative, want to find our ways to make it, to go in the market. And so um, I could say that as a, a concert planning today, it's very important to find a good balance between sharing the great tradition and keep uh, remembering about how important it is to still perform Chopin Ballade, but at the same time, 
make the audience aware that it's not the only thing that exists. And this plays a key important role in our society nowadays because this is what we are going to be able to offer to the next generation of musicians. Otherwise, people are just gonna be happy to listen to the CD by Vladimir Horowitz rather than coming to our concerts. And so far, the solution that I found in this Chamber Music Festival, which I direct, is to uh, always be aware of the two different parts, the tradition and the uh, initiative, and try to connect them in a way that the audience is going to be able to appreciate both parts. For instance, I remember that one time we planned a concert with a title in English because it worked for the grandma, uh, but it would not work for the audience because the audience would think this is strange. Uh, why, why, would it, why, why would I come to this when I can just go to the Bach Vivaldi concert? And uh, so, in the, but then the concert itself was a very normal concert with some poetry, some new music, but also some Bach and Vivaldi. So we just changed the title and before the bookings ended, we called it Bach and Vivaldi and poetry and the hall was full in the end. And then people would really appreciate the part that was the new music. It was full of uh, new improvisations and new compositions by the players. And they went there to ask them who wrote this beautiful thing. Uh, so it was all about just understanding how to sell it basically. And uh, this makes me go back to the institution talk because how to sell it is probably the very difficult topic that nowadays uh, we uh, are always trying to understand within our education because very often very good professors that can teach us how to be a personalized player they often have no idea how to make it in the career world and that's very frustrating sometimes because they are exceptional professors but they just have no idea what's happening around and uh, so this is why I keep underlining the importance of an institution that is aware of what's happening around because without that even if you become a very good player you're never gonna play anywhere and uh, despite it's not important for the art it's important to survive and work and um, without that you cannot develop as an artist because you can be the best possible artist ever but you do need to be able to sell what you're doing so that you can then develop it somewhere. And um, so I could just finish saying that um, I believe that uh, institutions and festivals and all the people that are connected to uh, the artistic world and to the concerts world are possibly as important as professors. And what we should try to find nowadays is to link these professorships and managers, institutions, concerts managers together in a better way because so far it was created so that it would work in a world that existed 40 years ago. But today is we really need this connection to be stronger, much stronger, so that a young player can develop all the skills that are required by nowadays uh, concert scene and be able not only to make it, but to make it in the good way, to be an exceptional player, but to be able to have concerts and not to be just an average strong player who gets concerts because he's a strong, uh, that he has very good skills. But at the same time, what we really would like to achieve is to have a great personality, a great musician that is able to cope with today's market and today's music scene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danilo. It was very inspiring. And I think uh, your oral uh, autoethnography, if I can call that, uh, really gave some new ideas to all of us and uh, to our virtual audience as well. And I think I, I had the, for the conclusion of the meeting some um, uh, quotes, some questions by Daniel uh, Lee Wilkinson ready. And I think you, uh, tackled some of them actually and or during your uh, speech. He's a musicologist and also emeritus professor at uh, King's College London and he asked like why are performers trained to sing and play scores with such a narrow range of interpretative freedom? Why aren't performances much more varied? 
by our critics so set against performances that differ from the norm? Why is faithfulness to the composer valued so much more highly in classical music than in classical theater? And then there comes also the concept of vertfeuer, right? The faithfulness to the original, that we try to be true to the score, to follow the instructions, to be accurate and stylistically correct. That are main ideas and the focus is, uh, uh, this is the focus of the classical musicians, but at the same time, it's not enough. And at the same time, the musician must also interpret the work with the aim of realizing the intentions of the composers. And um, I really want to thank you very much. We don't have so much time left, but I really want to give you maybe one or two minutes, each of you to kind of conclude the meeting and also the um, answer my question, which would be about the balance. Like how do we keep the balance between like creativity, innovation, uh, and also tradition and having this concept of working hard or working smart and creating the repertoire thoughtfully as Danilo mentioned, for example, for the concert. And also in Sweden, they always try like, they have like Beethoven symphony and then they have uh, Caroline Shaw, for example, who her like famous, uh, already famous 2018 concert, the water drop, and um, they played in with Helsingborg Symphony Orchestra, and that was amazed how these two like three century difference can go together very well. Okay, maybe we can start with Dina now, and then we continue with Nino, and then Danilo can finish. Sure, thank you very. Uh sure that I'm not sure. Uh, I think we are in transitional period right now. We are understanding that uh, what I call student-centered, and um, that's what actually Danilo was talking about, right? How, how to make sure that the students, undergraduate, graduate students, have successful careers and connect um, with the audience in, um, in case of the pianists, right? How, how do we accept that um, every musician, uh, ev every performer performing music is becomes music. How do we expect, uh, accept that not only Glenn Gould can be Glenn Gould uh, with his uh, sometimes arbitrary choices? Um, I think it will take us time uh, to, um, to create the audience that will um, that will transition together with us. But I think this is the direction we are going into and it will um, encourage plurality and it will encourage uh, repertoires that combine as uh, again, Daniela um, outlined music of Vivaldi and Bach and, um, and uh, as you ever <laughs> said, you ever said, uh, Carol and Shaw. I think it's ahead of us for uh, classical music, for serious music, for art music not to die, we need to meet our new audience halfway and create experiences for them that they feel as co-creators of music that they're listening to. Because I believe the music happens between the performer and the audience member. So that's what music is for me. And this is what I'm trying to do in my teaching, um, helping my students to become those people who become music for their generations and the next generation. Thank you. Maybe Nino, you could say some words at the end. Yes, first of all, I want to thank, uh, I had no uh, opportunity to do that, to thank uh, Dina and Danilo for very, very interesting and inspiring uh, uh, speeches. And unfortunately, we don't have time uh, so that I could uh, reflect upon some of the issues that they touched. But I hope we will uh, stay in contact and uh, have the opportunity to ask you questions maybe later when uh, uh, this is finished, uh, our session. As for your question, it's so difficult to answer um, some of your questions in two minutes. But again, I will say, I remember Kandinsky wrote once um, uh, that uh, the most important uh, function, uh, I'm paraphrasing him, of art is that it should reflect the spirit of its epoch. And I think our epoch is the epoch of democracy and the epoch of freedom, because never, never in the history of the world, uh, the world has been, um, it could be better, but that's democratic. And uh, this democracy could be applied to interpretation, 
uh, because you mentioned uh, uh, very interesting questions, yes, Ivery. It could be uh, uh, um, applied to compiling the programs. And I think if we find once again the right key of interpretation, Beethoven could really suit jazz, or even, even, even if we find the right key, Lady Gaga. And if we, that's the most important, once again, word that yeah, every meaning we know depends on the key of interpretation. I think the only thing that we have to do is to think and to find those keys and then everything, everything could be justified if we uh, really try to do that. I think that's my answer. And Dina has actually mentioned that it, it, the music is like, the, they may be not be the answers. It's like the qualitative research. You, you need to have the open, open question. It cannot be like yes or no, or no. yes, it is good or bad. It's always no. open. So I, I, don't, I don't expect to have the answers. We have the uh, interpretation, right? We have interpretation yeah. of the answers. Once well. again, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> we're interpreters and we're good at interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> Danilo? Um, so, of course, it's very hard to answer to this kind of question, and especially I don't have the same talking skill of, skills of my colleagues, but what I can add probably is that we are, we music people are the artists who engage with the audience, and we should never forget that, that we are going to create the taste for the next generations, for our listeners. It's not the audience or the concert managers that decide. They do come to the concerts and everything, but it's up to us to make them like the new contemporary music world that we are going to put in the program or our personal interpretation of the most mainstream work or anything else. Uh, and it's only up to us as the community to try to work towards that. Because of course there are many things we know that there are a lot of competitions that are killing the taste of music nowadays, as well as many music managers that just play safe because they want the people to come to the concert rather than making artistic choices. But it's up to our community to create what's going to be the next music situation for the next 20 years. And if we don't do that, it's always going to stay to let's do some Bach because that's easy and it's probably going to be very average played Bach and I would say that we should never forget that those concert pianists or big conductors that we remember that we think that they did only the things that we like they actually did that because Horvitz premiered Barber Sonata or we have conductors that premiered I don't know other Barber works or all the new works by Shostakovich that was edgy choices of repertoire back then and we should keep doing that instead of just playing safe because it's easier and we think it's right thank you absolutely thank you very much and i get uh, i think like the modern performance will get more like better geeks and better concerts if they play like unusual so-called repertoire if then playing their only bach or Beethoven or etc. I just want to make sure uh, that uh, we are on the right track and I'm so happy that to have you as the opening uh, speakers for the first meeting of the international discussion series Freedom in Music Education. Uh, for the disclaimer uh, of the, to the audience, I want to um, state that the opinions that you met here is the professional opinions and do not might not represent the official opinion by the uh, Tbilisi State Conservatory. And for the next week, uh, we meet for the second session and it will be on uh, Tbilisi State Conservatory Facebook page live uh, on 7th of March, uh, 4 p.m. CT, which is the 7 p.m. Tbilisi time. See you next time and thank you again to our participants. Thank you very much. Yeah.